Hi, everybody. Here we go. Would you open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5? We got a lot of work to do this morning. Open your Bibles. Lock in. Here we go. I don't have time for stories about how cute my kids are. I don't have time to show a hip movie clip like from The Matrix. I don't have time. If you want to see how cute my kids are, they're right over there. Right over there. And my brilliant wife, Donna. I don't have time to tell a story about a guy I talked to on an airplane. We got to get in the word. Ephesians chapter 5. Here we go. You ready? We're going to begin at verse 3. Wait, I can't do that. As I've prepared for this, I've had Paul in my head. And I'm imagining meeting him in heaven saying, hey, dude, probably dude us. Why didn't you read the whole letter? And I said, Paul, I only had half an hour, 25 minutes, but it's a letter. So we've got to make sure before we dive into all these commands we find in this passage, which are about holy living, living as God's people, we've got to make sure we ground it in what we can call the indicatives, the things that are established and true of those of us who are in Christ who have trusted Jesus, turned from our sin and repentance and trusted Jesus. And he starts off right off the bat in chapter one and says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in love. He predestined us to the praise of his glorious grace. That's what he tells us is true of us as Christians. Would you let that just wash over you? And then in chapter two, he says that we were dead in our transgressions and sins, but God made us alive together with Christ. The resurrection we're thinking about this Sunday with believers around the world is something we are identified with by faith in Christ, in our union with Christ. We are one with him. And if we move to commands, Paul wouldn't be happy if we didn't ground him in all the things that have been established and true. Or else I could hear Paul saying to me, if you don't make sure they know that this is all because of now who they are in Christ, they will slip into some sort of moralistic religiosity that isn't at all what I'm talking about. So let's not let that happen. Let's make sure we know that this is grounded in God's initiation, his finished work in Jesus by faith in Christ. If we move away from that, it will become all about us again, which is our big problem all the time. So Ephesians chapter five, we need to realize, begins at the beginning of the letter, but then after he lays this foundation of identity in Christ for three chapters, in chapter four, he turns a corner. And if you just flip back to chapter four, verse one, it says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of of the calling to which you have been called. That's who we are now. And then he gets on with living out this Christian life, this walking worthy of the gospel, what God has done for us. We have these things accomplished for us by God in Christ, and now he says, connect it to your daily living. And that's something so important and distinctive about the Christian life. It's connected to daily living. Jesus says, take up your cross daily and follow me. He doesn't say, just take a pilgrimage to Mecca or to a holy man on a mountain. He doesn't say, go off on a retreat and find me in just meditation, although that can be helpful. He says, this is something primarily that's worked out in the daily in, in the mundane traffic of life in the midst of all of it. Work it out. Connect these amazing spiritual realities God has accomplished. Every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. We're, we're as righteous as Christ himself in God's sight. Work these things out. Live according to your new calling. Walk worthy of the gospel. That's what he calls us to. Walking worthy of the gospel. And what I love about this turn in chapter four from what you could say, the indicatives, the established facts, to now the imperatives that start piling up in chapter four is he never leaves the identity behind, but where he starts in chapter four is not with the individual Christian, but with the church, 
with the body of Christ. You see, he starts talking about unity in the body of Christ and this walking worthy is worked out in the context of the local church. And as Lisa said, this is a great weekend. This is a, I don't know if this may, might be the only time we haven't been on break. It all, it's always been Easter break, but now it's spring break and you are here for Easter. And the good part of that is if you're not going home for Easter, this is a great time to get plugged into the body life of your local church where we are remembering with believers around the world Jesus' death and resurrection on Easter morning. It's a glorious time to be plugged in. And it's also a time a lot of people who usually don't go to church end up being there. So I highly encourage you to visit your local church this weekend if you haven't. And if you're not plugged in a local church, you're living like a pagan. You just are. And the, the Bible knows about believers meaningfully involved in the local church, believers who've been kicked out of the church because of disobedience, and pagans, really. And so local church involvement is vital for us. But that's where Paul directs us to life in Christ, in the body of Christ. And then in our chapter, chapter 5, beginning at verse 3, he begins these exhortations, these commands so let's read it now together, Ephesians 5, beginning at verse 3. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among the saints. Let there be no filthiness nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who's sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness. But now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of righteousness. But instead, expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light... It becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully then how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Okay, wow. There is a lot there. I hope you heard that. I hope this is landing on you as the Spirit of God uses the word he inspired to change us. My prayer is that we will all be different people when we walk out of here than when we walked in here. That's my prayer. I hope every time you come and hear the word preached, that is your goal. That is your prayer. That you leave here closer to Christ, more like Christ, convicted of sin, renewed in hope, overwhelmed with God's grace toward you. That's what we all realize today, that a holy God has said, come unto me, all you sinners, come and I will forgive you. 
You don't bring anything but your sin and you receive forgiveness in Christ. And out of that gospel truth that's taken heart, root in our lives, we now live the way this passage is describing. And the first thing I want you to notice is how radical our identity is from what it used to be. I am concerned that in the church we are losing a robust doctrine of conversion. There's this idea that we just want to fit in, but there's this idea that we were darkness. Did you hear it? And now we are light. We used to be something we're not anymore. We left that behind. The old is gone. The new has come. We're new creatures in Christ. We shouldn't want to fit in so much that we don't recognize that we are not who we used to be. We left that behind, and even though that old man acts like he's still alive, Jesus defeated him, and we need to live walking in the Spirit and filled with the Spirit and free of that sin that used to own us and doesn't anymore. We've been liberated from sin. We're mired in it so often, though, and we need to believe in true conversion. One of the things that was the best thing about Billy Graham's legacy, who just died a couple of weeks ago, was that Billy Graham's preaching clearly preached and believed the clear biblical teaching that we are converted. Now, you may not have a stark realization of your conversion. A lot of you came to Christ as little kids. A lot of you came to Christ before your lives were going in the pit and were showing lots of evidence of our equal fallenness. But just because, as Billy Graham's wife said, you may not remember when the sun came up, but you know it's shining on you. Realize that no matter when God said, you're coming with me now, he pulled you out of darkness, out of a pit, out of slavery to sin, and now he's liberated you into freedom. Know that there's a radical difference between the two ways of living. Now, you know, there's such a difference between when the sun comes up, when there are clouds, and when there aren't clouds. When the sun comes up with no clouds, pow, it's obvious it just came up. But when there are clouds, it's not as obvious. Sometimes the sun can, can be up and it gets light and it's gradual. And that may have been your experience, but the truth is, regardless of what your experience may be, there was a point in time where God turned you from a child of darkness, a son of disobedience, to a son of obedience, to a, a, a child of light, to one who now is the one who is connected to the one who said he's the light of the world and who who now says we are the light of the world in him. And so we believe in this amazing truth of conversion and realize all these things he keeps calling us. It doesn't just move to commands. It continues to root the commands in who we are. I just want to list six different ways he continues to describe us. The first is, he starts off in verse 1, as we're beloved children. We're not trying to earn our, our childhood before God now. We're not trying to earn his love. We are beloved children. See verse one? We are loved by God. Loved as much as the son. When the father says to the son at Jesus' baptism and at his transfiguration, behold, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. You need to hear those words if you've trusted Jesus as applying to you as well. God couldn't love you more than he does. He couldn't because he loves you in the son. He loves you as much as he loves his beloved son because you have union with him and you're a co-heir with him. And so rest in that love. You're a beloved child. J.I. Packer says, oh, it is a great thing to be forgiven by God, but an even greater thing still to be declared righteous by him and an even greater thing still to be adopted by him. You see, that takes our relationship with God, not just as forgiven sinners, not as declared righteous, but as his children, beloved children, live in that identity rooted in it. I pray this for you. Oh, the, the freedom that comes with knowing you're a loved child of God with nothing left to prove, nothing left to earn, nothing left to demonstrate before God or anyone else because Jesus did it for you. That leads to a freedom. That's astounding. And then what else does he call us? He says, look, in verse three, we're called saints. Live this way because those other ways are not proper among saints of God. Do you know 
that we, God's people in the New Testament are called the Hagioi, the, the holy ones, the saints of God, 67 times. There's no more important collective title for us as Christians than the holy ones. We're the holy ones of God, the set apart ones, the ones now pulled out of our old life into our new life and completely devoted to him. We belong to him entirely, body, soul, spirit, mind. We're all his now. We're the saints of God, the ones devoted to him. I think one of the most tragic things that happened in the history of the church is when the word saint started getting applied to a select few Christians. Saints are not a select few. Saints are all the people of God. If you've trusted Jesus, you are a saint. You are a set apart one. You're part of the Hagioi, the ones who are no longer worldly, living in the world and for the world and loving this world, which used in that sense is this system opposed to God and his ways. We're saints now. We're set apart ones. Listen to Peter in 1 Peter. He who called you is holy, so be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you should be holy, for I am holy. John puts it this way in 1 John 2. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. We need to love what God loves and hate what God hates because that's what it means to be saints. What else does he call us? Well, by implication in verse 6, we're called sons of obedience. We're no longer among the sons of disobedience. We're sons of obedience. Verse eight, we're called light of the Lord and children of light. What's light? It's purity. It's, no, it's knowledge. It's truth. We're people of truth. You know, the Bible does say God is love, but do you know in 1 John 1, before it says that in 1 John 4, the Bible says God is light. And in him, there's no darkness at all. We don't want to just be known for love. We want to be known for love that is truthful love. Let's get rid of this idea that, that love could ever be devoid of truth. I even hear people say, you got to love people before you tell them the truth. As if they're in any way possibly separated. As if telling people the truth isn't as loving as anything you can do. We're children of light that are intended to expose the fruitless deeds of darkness. We're children of light. It's a glorious thing to be called. Jesus is the light of the world. He says we are the light of the world and we no longer walk in darkness. We're children of light now. We're a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. And finally, the sixth thing, we're called wise ones. Verse 15, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. We are the wise ones. We're the ones who walk according to God and his ways and not the ways of the world. We're different. I hope you love being different. Sometimes I think the church is so like a bunch of junior high kids who just want to fit in and just want to be liked. Every time I see a little Jewish kid with a yarmulke, I think, oh, there's something good about from your earliest days having to go to school with people saying, what's that all about? But even more important than external displays of difference, internal character that's different, different ways of living our lives. I hope you love the calling of being different than the world and don't want to so be liked and considered cool by the world that you orient your life around that instead of holy living as we're called in this passage. We're the wise ones. Listen to Colossians 1. For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we've not ceased to pray for you and ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. And so we are the people of God, children of light, children of obedience, no longer what we used to be, thank God. And now, as Paul says in Philippians 3.16, live up to what you've already attained. That's this paradoxical, amazing tension of walking as God's people. And what I want you to realize is we have all these things we're told not to do, and something strange has happened in my lifetime, in our culture. People think you can say yes to something without necessarily saying no to its opposite. I even hear phrases like, we want to be known what we're for, not what we're against. As if that's even possible. 
Now, I understand we don't want to just be known what we're for or against, but every time you're for something, you're against its opposite. And we've lost that realization of basic reality. That if you want to love, you know, the Bible says things like, um, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Let love be genuine, abhor what is evil. Before goodness, be against badness. Before righteousness, be against unrighteousness. You can't be for goodness if you're not abhorring evil. Cling to what is good. Know the difference, first of all. Have discernment and know the difference between good and evil because you know what happens. We don't boot up knowing the difference. The Bible says we need to have our senses of discernment trained to discern the difference between good and evil because first of all, we can't even tell the difference unless we have our senses of discernment trained by the Spirit of God and the Word of God among the people of God. But you know what happens? Not only can't we tell the difference, you know what we do? We flip it just like we constantly see in our society. And not only do we not know the difference between good and evil, we call evil good and good evil. And we celebrate what's evil and we think goodness is bad, bigoted, mean. And it's not true. The Bible says we have to have no's with our yeses. Yes, say yes to who we are now, but that includes saying no to things like what? Sexual immorality. Porneo. Sexual Behavior outside of committed marriage between a man and a woman committed before God for life. That's sexual immorality. You include any category in there. And this word impurity is basically a, a, the same way of talking about sexual immorality, but in the mind, in the desires. It's not just external behavior. Actually, every external behavior that's sexually immoral begins with sexually immoral thoughts. And he's saying, get, get rid of external and internal sexual immorality. Oh, do we need to hear this? I grieve over the way sexual immorality is destroying churches and Christians and families. And the blight of pornography needs to be met head on as a war, which is what it is. It's taking us out of the game, people. It's making us fruitless. It's making us no different than the world because the privacy and the accessibility is killing us. Can we just go to war with this together? I'm so discouraged often and grieved often at the way this is taking over in our lives. Let's go to war with this. This has no place among the children of light. Let's see what it is and call it what it is and go to war with it. He says, don't let there even be a hint of it. Be beyond reproach in this. Don't get close to the line. Get as far away with it from you can, as you can. Take, take radical measures if need be. I have a friend every time he teaches on pornography and guys always say, oh, I don't know, I'm just mired in it, I'm stuck in it. And he says, I got a solution to your pornography problem on your computer. And he pulls a baseball bat from behind the pulpit and he says, just smash it. Just do whatever it takes. You know, Jesus uses this strong hyperbole, gouge out your eye, cut off your hand, do whatever you need to to get away from these things that are taking us out. We've got to get serious about this in a spirit-filled, gospel-dependent way. We've played around too long thinking we're way stronger than we really are, not realizing that sin easily entangles. And then, fascinatingly, he combines sexual immorality with covetousness in verse 3. I love that the Bible doesn't sort of say, well, that's really bad, but materialism, ah, eh, not so bad. Living your life to gain as many possessions as you can, not caring about the poor. You know, it's interesting. The church tends to divide these days over those, the churches that really care for the poor and are merciful and those that are opposed to things like sexual immorality. There's no division like that in the Bible. Read the prophets. They're, they just say, you don't care for the poor and you visit prostitutes. Stop. It's amazing. No division like that in the Bible. We need to store up our treasures in heaven where moth and rust don't destroy and thieves don't break in and steal. And then he says in verse four, there should be no filthiness, foolish or empty talk or coarse joking. I bet I've sinned more in the name of humor than any other way. 
you know, we sort of give you a pass if it's humorous. No, no, coarse joking, things that aren't edifying, things that are cynical, empty talk, things that aren't edifying and helpful. He says just one, one chapter before in verse four, 20, uh, chapter four, verse 29, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only which is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And instead of these things, have hearts of gratitude, thankfulness. It's interesting, he contrasts idolatry with gratitude. Why is that? Idolatry is giving worship and gratitude to things that don't deserve it. Great gratitude, thankfulness, is giving worship and gratitude to someone who does, God. And then finally he says, don't be drunk. Don't give away your self-control. That leads to debauchery, dissipation, carelessness, unprofitability. There's nothing funny about drunkenness. God hates it. It gives our our self-control away to substance rather than to the spirit. And he contrasts the spirit, uh, the spirit-filled life now, the grateful, worshipful life, as the, the passage concludes, with all of these other things. So let me give some concluding exhortations. One, be careful how you walk. When you hold the baby, you're all your attention's on that baby. You don't want to drop it. You want to care for it. You don't want its head to, to flop around. You want to care for that baby. And he's saying, be careful how you walk. Pay attention to it. Be circumspect. Be intentional. Don't be lackadaisical. Move into your day knowing that you're in a spiritual warfare. Your soul's at stake. The souls of other are at stake. Let's get after it. Be careful how you walk with accuracy, precision, and close attention. The Christian life is of grave importance and urgency. And I know apathy's cool these days, but not from God's perspective at all. Don't be involved in fruitless deeds of darkness. Second exhortation, redeem the time. Make the most of every opportunity. Do away with these ideas of, of uh, how close can I get to the line? No, make the most of it. Don't just say what's wrong with it. Say what's right with it. Don't just say how far can I go with my girlfriend, but how can I behave with her so God's really pleased and she's really edified so when she breaks up with me, she'll invite me to her wedding someday. That's a great goal. You know you did a good job if you get invited to the wedding. And then her new husband comes over and says, thanks, brother, for dating my wife. I'm serious. Make that your goal, not just how far is too far. Don't live with that sort of negative mentality. Righteous living then leads to fruitful living. Make the most of every opportunity. Exhortation three. Seek a righteous life. Don't seek a blessed life because a blessed life is the result of a righteous life. The Bible does not say, blessed is he who hungers and thirsts for blessedness. It says, blessed is he who hunger and thirsts for righteousness. And when you live according to God's ways and righteousness, you will find you are blessed. And finally, let's help each other. We need each other. We're created to grow in these ways together. You know, when I was growing up in my neighborhood and on my teams, I played football and basketball and ran track. And when you did something well, there was this great expression we used to use, that's you. Like somebody would make this sweet move to the basket and make a layup and say, that's you. Right? You get really excited for him. And when we do something stupid, like throw it out of bounds or dribble it off his foot, you say, come on, man, that ain't you. It's not who you are. And then that kind of died out. But then uh, in the uh, last 10 years, there was represent. Right? Represent your neighborhood. Never represent your team. Represent how good you are, our team, how good we are. And now it's kind of shifted to let's go, which means let's do what we said we are. Let's play according to how we are. That's how we need to be with each other. When we see each other acting like Jesus, we need to say, that's you. That's you. That's who you are now. And when we see one another acting unlike Jesus, we say, baby, that ain't you. That's what we need to say. Come on. You're a child of light now. What are you doing? Clicking on that website. Get off of that child of light. We need to encourage each other in that way. We need to say, represent Jesus. Represent who you are now. That's who we are now. That's how we need to be. Encouraging each other to walk worthy of the gospel. Let me pray. Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu.